I uh, want to welcome everyone to our midweek uh, service um, as we continue our study uh, in prayer, on prayer. <clears throat> and we're going to be picking up uh, where I left off last time in Philippians. We're going to be uh, finishing up uh, that prayer, Philippians chapter 1, uh, with a focus on verses 10 and 11 uh, tonight. Um, I hope and pray that all of you have had a, a good day and a good week so far, and uh, we're anticipating and looking forward to see what the Word has to tell us tonight. So let's go to the, to the Word, and then we'll open up in prayer and get started. Philippians chapter 1, I believe I'm going to start back a little few verses earlier. I'm going to start with verse 3. <clears throat> I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we praise you, and we do glorify your name. We thank you for you revealing yourself to us in your holy word. We thank you for the truth that is found within. We pray, Father, that your spirit would reveal this truth to us, Father, and that would draw our affection and our love towards your word and our desire to be obedient to your word and to see it as a mirror that we look into and to understand who we are but most likely who you are and the vast gap that exists their only hope is in the one and only son jesus christ to fill that gap and to reconcile us unto yourself we pray to be with us tonight and to give us understanding christ and we pray Okay, so we're going to be looking at uh, primarily verses 10 and 11. I'm going to, like I said, pick up where I left off. And, and again, just to remind you of where we are here coming into these, uh, these verses. Um, initially, I began to talk about when we, when we uh, began in verse 9, where it says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. Uh, we talked about this uh, abundant love, this... Uh, overflowing love we and we sort of defined it as sort of like of a of a, a fast moving river that's uh, uh, that's almost like a flooding river uh, type of love that's abounding more and more and more <clears throat> we talked about this agape love this uh, unique love that we have uh, for uh, for others uh, the, the love uh, that's not a selfish self-centered love but a, a true love uh, for those uh, around us as agape love. And then, again, we talked about the river banks, uh, per se, of this river, fast-moving river, uh, the sort of the guardrails that sort of guides and directs uh, this uh, abundant love, of the, of a river bank, sort of what we call knowledge and one of discernment. And we talked about uh, that just random love, love without purpose, love that's just indiscriminate in one sense, uh, and it's a love that's much like the love that the world talks about uh, today um, is, is not the love that we find in Scripture. Uh, it's not the love that Christians are supposed to have uh, for one another and love that we have for God. That anytime love is mentioned in, in guidance and direction and counsel to uh, believers, it, it includes at least includes the, the work of knowledge, that you, you, it's not just a, 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 um, 
abandoning love, but it's a, a love that's, that's directed by knowledge and then the discernment uh, of that knowledge that you have and proper use of knowledge. It's not about just an intellectual knowledge that we can puff ourselves up and build up and say we know all these things, uh, but yet not have discernment. Then we began to speak about that uh, it's not about just to have this abounding love and to have uh, knowledge and discernment, but also that we put this to work. We put it into a practical application. It's not about uh, to have uh, discernment, but it's to use discernment. And then that's when it speaks about uh, in verse 10 where it says, so that uh, you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And we focused last time on uh, the approving uh, what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless was the primary focus of, of last week. And we talked about this idea of approving um, what is excellent. Uh, we talked about the distinction between, it's not necessarily between what is good and bad, uh, but it's between what is good and what is better or what is best, as, as we talked about that. We also talked about this idea of to be pure. In some, in some translations, it has the word sincere uh, and blameless. And the idea of this sincerity and purity is that we would, uh, uh, we, as we assess flaws in our life, that we, we don't uh, become hypocritical and try to cover up that as many times... Uh, potters would do back in the early days with vessels that they would create if there was a crack, uh, an impurity uh, per se in that pottery, they would use a wax to cover it up, and we would call that sort of the act of hypocrisy. Blameless, we spoke about uh, the idea of being a stumbling block uh, to others, that when you're blameless, uh, that you're in a, um, it, meaning that we, we, we don't put ourselves in a position to be a stumbling block to our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. But what we didn't get to last week, and I want to I want to follow up with and conclude uh, tonight, is this reference to, first of all, for the day of Christ. And, um, you know, as we look at, whether, you know, different varieties and viewpoints on eschatology and viewpoints on the whether it's day of the Lord or day of Christ, this idea uh, that's being uh, demonstrated here in Paul's prayer, uh, where um, it says, um, excuse me, it says for the day of Christ. Some translations might say until the day of Christ. So for and until gives you this mindset or this, this concept that what Paul is praying for here is this um, idea that we're to carry out a particular practice and a, um, uh, of, of being pure and blameless um, and showing this abounding love with knowledge and discernment during a period of time. It's from the period of time from when he communicated the message to a time that the Lord returned until we have to confront in the, in the end days when the second advent comes it's this idea or mo uh, of motion or moving toward glorification. Uh, it's an idea of uh, the word until is an expression of that gap of time before the return of Christ and what condition should continue is to be pure, blameless, and fruitful. Those are the things that Paul is, at, at, is praying for on behalf of the Philippians is that they be pure, blameless, and fruitful till the time that the Lord returns. Uh, the day of Christ, we also, when we see, uh, hear that phrase or see that phrase, it can allude to the part of the future day when believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed, recompensed, recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I got the word out, didn't I? I said about three times. Uh, 1 John 2.28 says, And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Also, we see other scripture verses, uh, mainly written by Paul in his epistles, 
Uh, we look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge. We hear that word knowledge again even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you're not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless, hear that word again, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see a reference to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ again there. Look at Philippians earlier uh, in chapter 1 of Philippians is, that I just read a minute ago. It says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Then we see it again in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. We see it again, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand, and I hope you will understand until the end, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud, also you also were ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. Again, Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Um, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, me to, award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved is appearing. So this reference on the day of Christ or on that day is referencing where believers will become into the presence of Christ where their works will be judged and their rewards will be given. Second Colossians chapter 5, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 through 10. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So you can see this reinforcement of Paul in his prayer to the people at Philippi uh, that he is referencing and speaking to in his prayer, this purpose and this intent and the goal, and one of the goals or the ultimate aims uh, for their love to be abounding with knowledge and discernment to be uh, so that they would be pure and blameless for that day. So the sobering reality of the day of Christ should have a purifying effect on the life of every saint. So we should be looking to that day, and we should be always understanding as we're growing and we're developing 
in our knowledge and our discernment of the Word of God and as we're bearing fruit uh, in our life, that there is an accounting that will take place. There is going to be an accounting that takes place. And as I've shared in, in previous sessions prior to tonight, when we assess our, our life as a believer, we need to assess our life and understand where are we building our treasures. Are we building eternal treasures that will be with us forever? Or are we building temporary treasures that will pass away? And you can see here where Paul's goal is, what his hope is, what his aim is for the people at Philippi. So here you see a model for us as we pray for one another as believers that it's okay, like I've said before, to pray for temporary needs as we live our life here on this earth. But the greater prayer, the best prayer that we should be aiming for is that we would be fitted to be honorable presented to the Lord on the day of Christ. And Paul references that many times in several of his prayers as well. A new thought as we begin here in Philippians chapter 1, verses 11, uh, you can see where we're going to pick up here where it talks about having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here we're talking about a new a concept that we haven't spoken about yet. It's this idea of having been filled with a fruit of righteousness. So I want to hone in on those words first. So let's look at uh, Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 22. As a reference here, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we can see here uh, fruits of the Spirit our fruit of righteousness. Obviously, we, uh, through our teaching and, and sermons and, and understanding um, of the gospel message, we understand this transaction that happens uh, when, we are, when we are saved, when we're reconciled to God. There's a transaction that takes place where our sins are transferred to Christ and he bears the full penalty and the wrath of those sins. And his righteousness is transferred to us so that when God sees us, he sees us through the righteousness of his son, Jesus. So it's as if Jesus committed our sins and paid the penalty, and it's as if we live this perfect life. But this idea that is speaking about here, the fruit of the righteousness, is not speaking to that righteous transaction by itself but the result of that righteous transaction. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verses nine, or verse 9, it says, For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Hebrews 12, 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit. Of righteousness. So this idea of righteousness that Paul is speaking to here is really a reference to our position to God the Father and also to our practice. So it's the righteous is in our position uh, and also in our practice. This idea of having been feel, filled, Paul has just described the coming day of Christ when all saints will see and stand before their Lord blameless. Fruit of righteousness probably describes our position blameless and or our practice, which is the fruit that brings glory to God. King James Version Bible uh, commentary comments on being filled. The word, the Greek uh, for the word filled is plero, 
uh, means to make full, cause to abound, fill to the full. This Greek perfect participle expresses the present results of a past action. They have been filled and are still filled. There is no room for anything else. There is no room for any other fruit. With the fruits of righteousness, righteousness fruit, which are by Jesus Christ. This fruit cannot be produced by human power, but only by the Holy Spirit as the believer is in vital union with Christ. Unto the glory and praise of God, this is the spiritual purpose of all Christian endeavor. So this idea that we're bearing fruit, this, this prayer that Paul is calling uh, the Philippians to, that we are called to, to bear, is not a fruit of our own. It's a fruit that originates, that is caused, that is sourced by Christ himself that any fruit that we try to create or manipulate or manufacture uh, in our life that is counter or outside the work of Christ in us is a perishing fruit. It's a temporary act that will not have lasting ability. And what's so intriguing is that the works that we perform, the righteous works that we carry out on this, on this earth, for the believer are the very works that God has ordained and decreed from eternity past. <clears throat> In John chapter 15, verse 5, we see this connection where he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides, that's present tense, in me, and I in him, he bears, present tense, much fruit. For apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing nothing. So this connection to be joined with the vine, for those that are joined with the vine, will naturally result in fruit bearing. Just as sap flows through a tree, out to the limbs, out to the branches, and, and to the leaves, and the fruit that it bears, it's a natural event that happens in the life of a true believer, is that when the Spirit dwells within us, there will be a natural result of fruit that will, manu that will, will uh, show itself. And it will be a fruit that demonstrates the type of person that we are and what we believe. Oftentimes you would see parables and references in scriptures where obviously there's a reference to a fig tree. A fig tree should show fruit of figs. It's not going to show apples. And so there's a contradiction if someone claims to be a believer, and yet there is no fruit that is born as a result of their confession. It is God's purpose to produce such good works in all believers because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. So we see here that even God himself, as he uh, tells us to bear fruit, he commands us to bear fruit, he tells us in his word to bear fruit, it's God is bringing about the fruit that we bear. So you can see God as a source, when we think of our, our salvation experience, we can see the work that is sourced by God, the life that we live, the life that we have, is all sourced by God himself. So he not only provides the, the, the solution in the redemptive act, redemptive act of Christ and providing his son, he not only provides that, he also provides and equips us with the spirit to dwell within us and the works beforehand have been determined that we will carry out in this world, and then he'll reward us for the very works that he gave us to carry out. Now, that's an interesting dynamic. So he really has this thing end to end, from eternity past to eternity future, he has it all in his control. So the very glory that he re receives from us is the glory 
that he gives for us to return back to him. Comment here is there can be absolutely no fruit of righteousness in anyone's life apart from a continual dependence on the sufficiency of the indwelling spirit of Christ. And I, and I tell you, if many of you may have known people or you may have been one of those people, I know I went through periods of time in my life, and a lot of times it'll happen at the new year. You know, every time you come up to a new year, you have what? New Year's resolutions. I think that's probably the, uh, I think at the new year is when they sell more exercise equipment than any other time of year. I think they sell more diet books and diet material uh, that time of year. If you're going to try to sell something where people, people are trying to improve themselves in some form or fashion, the first of the year is the best time to put it on the market. Because for some reason, we've got this mindset that when we turn from December 31st to January 1st, that somehow we do this reset that we're automatically going to manufacture and do something noble, good for ourselves or for other people. Now, there's nothing wrong in itself to have a noble thought or an idea to want to improve yourself or improve the lives of others around you. But where the problem does happen is someone who's not a believer and January 1st comes around, they say, hey, I think I'm going to start doing all these Christian things. And, uh, and you'll realize that they won't persevere in that work. Probably come February 1st, they will have forgotten about their commitments on January 1st, and they will eventually fade away. Now, for the true believer who commits themselves to deeper study, to seek after greater knowledge and greater understanding, a discernment of God's word, and they pray to God and asking him for these things, those are noble endeavors that will persevere. But anything that we try to manufacture and do outside the work of God and the spirit of God that dwells with us will not last. And you will soon be found out. As we move on here, we see another thought here is that as really we get to the ultimate aim of Paul's prayer, and that is um, as it relates to uh, bringing glory and praise to God. Because ultimately, that is the reason we are created and put on this earth is to bring glory to God. It's our highest purpose. The Westminster, Westminster Catechism says that the man's chief end is to glorify God. The Puritan author, Thomas Watson, rightly reminds us that God in all things may be glorified. The glory of God is a silver thread which must run through all our actions. Whether therefore you eat or drink, Scripture tells us, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all the glory of God. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. So we can see here that the ultimate aim as at the conclusion of this prayer that Paul is praying um, is that God will be glorified. Now, what's important to understand as well, when we think about God, we're talking about God of Scripture, God of the Bible, not the God that we manufacture and make up in our minds. Sometimes I think that uh, we believe that when we lift up our praises and our glory to God, somehow we're enhancing God. Or we're adding something to God that he didn't have before. But if we truly believe the biblical God He's an immutable God. He's a God that's never changing, um, that remains constant, that doesn't need anything from his creation to add or take anything away from who he is. But he does demand our worship. And we are to worship and we are to glorify God, and it should be a natural result of the indwelling spirit within us that everything we do in this life should have the aim and the goal and the focus for it to be honoring, pleasing, and glorifying to God. As we are image bearers of the one who made us, we should reflect back the glory of the God who created this work. 
And so Paul here is praying that the people of Philippi, that their ultimate aim for them to have this love, this knowledgeable love, this discerning love, so that they could be pure and blameless, presented to the Lord with fruits of righteousness, all these uh, ultimately culminate with the idea of bringing glory and honor to God. Glorifying God has, has respect to all the persons of the Trinity. It respects God the Father who gave us life, God the Son who lost his life for us, and God the Holy Ghost who produces a new life in us. We must bring glory to the whole Trinity. Paul repeatedly emphasized the principle that although he is called to, to work, it was God who alone was to receive the glory, writing these words. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I. But the grace of God with me ultimately is God's transforming power, which enables supernatural fruit. So then the final analysis is discussed that we just discussed, he alone can receive the glory and the praise. And so we see that the highest purpose of Paul's prayer was that God's nature and character would be manifestly magnified for all to see. As a fruit in us comes forth supernaturally, believers and non-believers alike are able to see through this supernatural effect the handiwork of the supernatural one, the only one worthy of praise. So it's my hope, it's my prayer, that as we have been talking about prayer and talking about uh, what does the scripture say about prayer and what guidance and direction does it give us in praying. And I hope uh, that we can look and see in the studies that we've done in Paul's prayers, the examples that he displays, that he is kingdom-minded, as we have shared many times uh, in his prayers. He cares and he loves the saints. He thanks God continually every time he is mindful and thinks of, fellow, of his fellow saints. Those that are participating with him in his ministry, those that he has taught, those that he planted churches, those that were results of others who planted churches, um, he always was praying that their knowledge and that would grow more and more and more in their understanding of who God is, what the Word of God says, uh, who they are, and how they are to conform more and more and more into the likeness of Christ with the ultimate aim that we bring glory and honor to our God. So the question that we have for ourselves is as we pray for others, what are, what are the, the methods or the means or the, the, the thoughts that we go through when we pray for fellow saints? And we, it's great to pray for those, as I said, those that need comfort, those that are suffering, those that are dealing with trials and, and afflictions in their life. Um, all the things that a, a fellow believer may experience in this world. We should pray for them, but our ultimate prayer should always be not that they just get through these temporary things, but they're, they're more fitted for the day of Christ. But that's eternity. These days are going fast, and they're going faster, it feels like. Um, and I just encourage all of us as we pray to be mindful of the prayers that we learn from the Apostle Paul and how he prayed for fellow believers. So thank you. That concludes tonight. And I want to thank those that may be joining uh, live stream as well. So we'll close in prayer. Merciful God, we praise your name. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your spirit that dwells within us, that enables us, that guides us, that leads us, that propels us, that convicts us in this life. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we are participants in the sanctifying process in this world, that we are obedient, Father, to the Spirit within us, and that we find ourselves growing more and more in the likeness of your Son, so that we would be fitted 
we would be presentable and honorable in your sight, Father. So when those rewards are passed out, eternal reward, that you would see the works, the fruits of righteousness that you have given us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name.